So this is part two of Lovers Rock More Than a Dance Floor. If you haven't seen part one, I suggest that you go and see it um, or look out for it. Um, and then hopefully everything will fall into place. I'm just going to call them exactly the same thing, except for it's going to be part one, part two, part three, until the book is finished. I'm Myrna Loy. I'm the author of Lovers Rock More Than a Dance Floor. This is the um, condensed version. There is a more comprehensive um, version that talks about what was going on politically around the, that time in the 1970s and 1980s, um, and that can be got on Amazon, Lovers Rock More Than a Dance Floor, by yours truly. Um, and yeah, like I said, if you're, subscri if you're subscribing and you've just met this video, just come across this video and you're wondering why she wearing dark glasses, don't trust her, don't trust anybody who I can't see their eyes, it's because I recently had an eye ulcer and I'm recuperating from it. My eyes are light sensitive a little bit. And so until I can get that sorted out, I am wearing my dark glasses. So I hope I've got rid of all the preliminaries and we can get on with chapter two. Well, this is chapter three, sorry. So this is the cover of the book, Love is Rock More Than a Dance Floor, but the cover of the more comprehensive version is different, but similar. Um, <clears throat> so this is called chapter three, The Dance Floor. My mind goes back to a dance I went to in my in my early 20s. I remembered going to the dance and seeing this tall, red-skinned man. I was normally attracted to dark-skinned men, but there was something charismatic about this man. I glanced in his direction, and he glanced back. My eyes turned and met his every now and then. No words were spoken. There was always that moment when I first got on the dance floor when I wasn't 100% sure I was going to be asked for a dance. But if I did, a second dance, third, fourth, fifth dance would almost be guaranteed. I remember praying quietly, please ask me to dance, while I stood rocking to the music on my own as though I didn't business. But when I felt somebody gently tug my arm and I turned round and it was him, I said in my heart, yes. It was about three o'clock in the morning when he pulled me for a dance. I was so gone. I remember him towering over me, bending over me like a piece of soft rubber. You've got a strong buck, he whispered. I remember behaving shy and stupid. I had a way of behaving girly-girly when I was out of my depths. I was nervous. He was so good-looking. I didn't know how to respond, and it felt so good being in his arms. I didn't want him to let me go. He, made, he held me tight and pulled me towards him. His hand pressed the middle of my back, forcing our midsections to meet. I was gyrating my hips, and I knew I was good at it. I also knew that one dance with me wouldn't do and he would not be dancing with anyone else for the night and he didn't. If you danced with a man four or five times on the trot, you knew you were more or less in. If he asked you for a drink, you knew you were definitely in there. He asked me for a drink and I could not stop grinning to myself. I must have looked like a Cheshire cat. I felt embarrassed when I caught myself. I don't even remember who I came there with because once I started dancing with him, I didn't remember anything else. He left my side to get me a drink. After about five minutes, I felt a gentle tug at my elbow. I turned around smiling, thinking it was him, but it was someone else. I'm here with someone, I said. It felt good saying I was here with someone. Well, I was, practically. So we aimed it. Him shouldn't be a good-looking woman like you, by yourself. I felt weird, because it felt rude to pull away after I was practically in his arms already. All, all I could think of was, supposing that guy came back and saw me dancing with someone else. In the middle of the dance, I told him that I needed to go to the toilet and left. 
Just as I was walking to the toilet, I saw the red skin guy walking back. I wondered if he had seen me dancing with that guy because he looked a bit off. I smiled at him nonetheless and continued walking to the toilet. When I came back, he was dancing with someone else. I was gutted. Why did I leave the room? It looked like he had given her my drink too. I went and stood in the corner trying to enjoy myself by myself and he came over to me and stood next to me. I could feel the magnetism between us. I was gloating to myself. Good. He only danced with her once and he's danced with me five times. She's got no chance. I felt a bit more confident. Where did you disappear to? He asked me in a deep voice that had the, had me trembling. I just went to the toilet, I said, grinning. I told myself it must really, he must really care about me if he was asking where I was. We had, we used to build up these little stories at, back then where, you know, all a guy had to do is say, you know, where do you live or where have you been? And we thought, oh, you know, he cares. <laughs> but anyway, he gave me my drink. He hadn't given it to her. And before I could take a sip, he grabbed me by my waist and pulled me in towards him. And our bodies connected again in a sensual way. We went down, we came up, we went around. And it was as though we, we predetermined which way our bodies would go. There was no gap between us and each unpredictable move was instinctively matched. Synchronicity was in full swing in that dark corner as he pressed me against the wall. What's your name? he asked. Susan, I responded. I always said Susan. It was a name I could remember. What's yours? I boldly asked. Devon, he responded with a smile. He was looking deep in my eyes, forcing me to lower my eyelids in a modest way. We danced together for hours. Around seven o'clock in the morning, a woman came over to him and said, Devon, I'm going home now. He dismissed her with a nod and said, OK, see you later. She stood there for a moment as though she couldn't believe it, stared at him, then she glared at me, and then she walked off. She was not happy. Who was that? I asked, perplexed. Oh, it's a woman I came with, he responded calmly. But you've been dancing with me all night. So what? Uh, you didn't want me to dance with you? Yes, man, he said, slightly irritated. But I didn't know you came here with someone else, I continued and feeling a bit guilty about dancing with someone's man all night. Settle yourself, you see if, he responded, in a half English, half Jamaican accent. I should have really felt guilty, but his deep voice was reassuring. It made me smile. He made me feel warm inside. He put his arms around my neck and pulled me close to him, and we continued dancing where we left off. There was no loyalty amongst women those days. We danced until nine o'clock in the morning. He dropped me home after giving me a long hot kiss and arranged to meet him again, but we never did. Chapter four, is this a sign? There was a difference between Shabin, a blues party and a lover's rock rave. Each event attracted their own clientele. Lover's rock parties or dances were for the elite, we didn't rump and we would dress according to which one of the raves we attended. No point dressing up in our good, good clothes to go to a shabine. So we would wear our wallabies, maybe our leather trousers and a nice cream clean shirt. Regardless of where we went, we were always stylish and expensively put together. When we walked onto the dance floor, we could feel the eyes on us. We knew what we had to offer and we knew what men wanted. They wanted to feel safe in our arms and close to our bodies. We obliged them. I don't think as young people, we understood why we were magnetically and intimately drawn to strangers on the dance floor. We didn't know why the lower half of our bodies gyrated so smoothly and succinctly together to the lover's rock beat. It was almost as though the music magnetised couples together. 
When certain tunes came on, men became anxious. Their necks would crane to see which woman they would get, they could get close to. And were any of them giving them a signal that said, I don't mind dancing with you. The rude girl would t make it obvious she would wanted she wanted a dance. Men had to work it out for themselves. And they didn't want to walk the walk of shame. Women had the power and they knew it. They had to be selective, which man qualified to press his loins against hers. Women would be rocking from one foot to the other, giving an occasional eye contact. Men had to be alert just in case they missed it because they were too busy scanning the room, deciphering options. When the eyes met, that was a sign, followed by a touch on the arm. Sometimes there was no eye contact. So they used animal instinct to determine whether the prey was on heat or not. If he pulled her and she followed through, he would know his instincts were correct. Sometimes the men had control over unsuspecting women. Men could suss out the women who were easy to get. If their eyes contact was too long, that was a sign. If their dance steps were too exaggerated, that was another sign. If she danced out of beat or looked too eager, they were all signs. Discerning men kept their distance from eager women. They looked for the more reserved female that might pose a challenge. The one who, despite making an effort to smell and look good, might get turned down. A woman worth fighting for. The reserved woman was well-dressed. She was refined and she didn't smile much unless her girlfriends whispered something to her. On the dance floor, she was as serious as a heart attack. She was conscious about her gaze, the way her lips parted, the way she stood and where she stood. She was conscious about how she held her Saint packet of cigarettes so that the packet would be noticed. She made it obvious that the lighter she was using was a Rolex or a Dunhill. She, would minimal, minimal, she made minimal eye contact so that interested men would not know how to engage her. She knew her power. She also knew who she wanted to dance with. It could even be the same one who was vying for her attention, but he would never know. He needed to be brave enough to take that walk of shame and risk rejection. It was usually the Jamaican men who had the confidence to turn you, turn you around and expose your vulnerabilities. They would hold you in such a way that that stern exterior along with the cool composure collapsed. The men who hadn't had the guts to come over stood there, mouths open, wondering how the Jamaicans did it. Cha, cha sketel, the black British men would say to defend their ego. A leg of is that. That was because for them, for her to let her guard down so easily, because the Jamaican charm, she was easy. The rude girl didn't care what men thought of her. They had their own agenda, which was to secure a dance with someone who looked and smelled good and who had the charm and fortitude to approach her. Women like that didn't want no saps or butter, man. She wanted to feel a touch from a confident brother who did not fear rejection. So absorbed in our ego were some of us that we would turn position for a dance when a, when a touch on the arm was accidental. When that happened, we behaved like we didn't even turn around, continuing our bobbing dance and accentuating our dance steps, inviting the rude boy to a challenge. Most women on the dance floor secretly wanted to be held. Being asked for a dance was a form of validation. It told us that we looked good. It confirmed our attractiveness. It made us feel that the effort we had put into our clothes and accessories was worth it. There will always be those women who claim they didn't go to look for a man. I just come for the music. But make a man pull them for your dance and see if they say no. My posse were not ashamed to admit that we went looking for a partner on the dance floor. The majority of us would be discerning who we would get close to. They had to be well put together. A quick scan would qualify them. Polished shoes, sharp seam in their trousers, clean shirt, nice smelling cologne, a nice watch, freshly barbered skiffle, 
and is what we were looking for in our potential mate. Lovers Rock Melodies fulfilled an emotional need. The accompanying dance fulfilled the physical need. When you found someone who could dance, he was yours for the night, if he wanted to be. I knew how to whine. I used to torment the poor man then. I knew how to forget them. I would use slow, calculating movements to provoke, tease and entice. After a man danced with me once, provided I liked the look and smell of him, a following dance would be guaranteed. <laughs> yeah, bad girl, let me say. <laughs> Sometimes we would dance with our mates, which one of the men then... Oh, sorry. Sometimes we would discuss with our mates which one of the men that we would want to dance with. The men would think they were choosing us, but we had already done sus which man we had our eye on. It was a question of whether or not it was reciprocal. If they fancied us, there would be the eye contact and the slow step-by-step -step move towards the target. It was never swift and direct. The men were like lions surveilling their prey, circling the room, looking for signs of acknowledgement, eye contact, a smile. When received, the arm reached out and the tribal mating scene began. Rock and come in. Anyone could whine, but not everyone could find every corner. So I'm going to stop that one there and I'm going to go on to part three. Hope you enjoyed the series of Lovers Rock More Than a Dance Floor by Man of Line. And like I said, the comprehensive version of the political and social and everything else that was going on at the time can be found on Amazon. See you soon.